Uh, I want to start off by thanking uh, Joe Harrison for inviting me to be a part of this webinar today. I know I've been a little bit uh, hard to get a hold of for my transition from Idaho to Oregon, but I um, this study was a really special thing for me and a, a really large group of people, um, and I really like to share our findings with people, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of this today. So I'll um, start off with some basics, and so what we're talking about today is this one specific study that we've been conducting uh, in cooperation with ARS and April Latham uh, in Kimberly, Idaho, uh, looking at the impact of uh, multiple dairy manure applications to this uh, high value cropping system. And I'm gonna shed a little bit of background as to why we decided to do this study. And in the uh, South Central Idaho region, um, at around 2016, there was a standing herd of over 474,000 milking cows uh, concentrated into a six county region in South Central Idaho. And so um, where does all that manure go? It goes to the 421,000 uh, hectares of cropland in that same region. And that can be pretty intense um, at times. This is a photo uh, or a slide that April Latham put together and I really like it. And it gives you sort of a, a real feel of what we're actually talking about here. And so she uh, set it up so that each one of these cute little cows represents uh, over 700 uh, cow dairy. And this is just to give you an example of an area in Jerome County where there is a, a large concentration of these uh, dairies in one location or one small region. So what we see is that the manure coming from each of these dairies goes on to the fields surrounding these dairies. And you can see that even in some of these places, there's no way you could get all that manure on to these neighboring fields and would have to go further. Uh, the crop production here is predominantly alfalfa and corn. And so that's what we're used to uh, apply manure to and they take up a lot of nutrients. But we have to get the, that manure further away because we are starting to see phosphorus levels and other nutrient levels get, um, get a little too high on those fields. So one idea is to consider the high value ground that's further from the dairies. And in Idaho, that means places where there's potato production, malt barley production, sugar beets, and wheat. And um, there are grower concerns that come with this. When, you know, when the dairyman shows up with a bunch of manure to put on their field, they, they have had some concerns that they've relayed to us, and that included, uh, you know, what if they see uh, lowered yields, poor crop quality, or increased pest pressure caused by the application of manure. When I got to Idaho, that was something I heard a lot, where that people wanted to work with manure more, but they had a lot of concerns about things that um, that could happen and they couldn't, they didn't feel like they could afford the risk. So we created an eight year manure application study in order to explore how these uh, I, high value cropping systems that are specific to Southern Idaho, how they would respond to manure applications. And um, the reason why we went for eight years is because a lot of great work had already been done already at the ARS station in Kimberly, uh, looking at one-time applications of manure, and those kinds of studies are really common because that's, you know, allows you time often for a graduate student or gives you some, um, some answers pretty quickly, and it's very affordable to do it that way. Uh, unfortunately, what we see is that people, um, not unfortunately, but what we see is people will often put manure on not just one time and never again, but that's usually repeated. And so those systems were not as well understood. Getting into the design of the study, and this will help when we get into the uh, uh, agronomic part, kind of understand what the setup was. And so this was an eight year study and we broke ground in 2012. That's when we put down the first uh, fall manure application. And the study consisted of two adjacent fields at the Ag Research Service Station in Kimberly, Idaho. And this is what the crop rotation looks like. And so we were pretty diligent from the very, very beginning and knew our exact uh, crop rotation. And so you can see that it's a basic wheat, potato, barley, sugar beet uh, rotation. And that is um, one of many crop rotations that are used um, in Idaho. When I was 
putting this study together, we talked to a lot of people and there wasn't one very standard design um, to look at or crop rotation. So we worked with one that was not um, unusual and one that where we could have a certain type of design that we could accommodate. And the reason why we did two fields is that to allow us to produce more commodity information. So for example, if somebody from the wheat industry was interested in our study, they didn't want to just see wheat responses in 2013 and then have to wait all the way to 2017. Um, and so, and that made a lot of sense in turn, if you had a strange year, you, know, you weren't sure if that was the strange year or the manure or, or what was causing the effect. And so we set it up so now we're getting commodity um, information for each specific crop every other year. What we'll be talking about today is what we have done so far from 2013 to 2016. There is also 2017 data that is starting to roll in, but it hasn't been processed yet. And it was just kind of a nice halfway mark to go over this, uh, this period of, da of data that's been collected. Going a little further on the design, so we applied uh, a stockpiled dairy manure either every fall or we applied it every other fall before the wheat and the barley. And um, when we say stockpiled dairy manure, that's a typical way of storing manure in, in Idaho. The, the liquid is not as common, um, but it is used. Um, but we decided for this study to stick with a stockpiled dairy manure, which has an average of 50% moisture. Um, with a lot of variation there, of course. And the reason why I want this layout is because a lot of the potato and sugar beet growers had concerns about putting the manure on right before the potatoes or right before the sugar beets. And so they requested that we make sure to have the treatment that allowed for that space. So you're putting on manure, taking a year off before that potato or sugar beet, putting on the manure, growing the small grain again, and then taking another break. We worked with three different application rates, um, either 1734 or 52 um, megagram per hectare or uh, metric tons per hectare on a dry weight basis. And we went with those rates because the 17 megagram per hectare rate was closer to what you would see um, further from the dairy, uh, where if somebody just wanted to apply manure to you know, maybe get some more organic matter or get a source of phosphorus and potassium to their soil. While the 52, uh, megagram per hectare rate was what we were seeing uh, closer to the dairy where it was more of a disposal situation. So this translates to, to uh, roughly 35, 69, and 103 wet megagram per hectare um, because again on average there was 50 percent moisture content although this did vary widely um, between the years. So the treatments are we had one fertilizer only treatment um, one control treatment where no nutrients were applied, and the six manure treatments described above where we had three application rates and two frequencies, either every year or every other year, and those were supplemented as fertilizers as needed. We weren't trying to make it so that manure was the only nutrient source for these, nutri for these um, crops because that's not what a grower would do. They would supplement with fertilizers to make sure that their plants were doing okay. Uh, the setup was a randomized complete block design and we used four replications. And this is a photo of the south field taken in 2016 uh, with, a, with drone technology. And you can actually, I like this photo because you can actually see the control plots. There's one um, up in the front, one um, toward the back, and then two side by side in the back left. And um, so you can see that starving them from nitrogen and applying no nutrients over a four-year period, those, those plants were definitely hurting. And we were doing that for more of a soil comparison standpoint. A grower is not going to do that, but that does help us understand what the soil is releasing itself so that we can understand how to subtract that from our treatment. In terms of how much um, manure, how much nutrients we added over the four-year period, so I, I chose to put to combine what we had added up to this point and put it in one table. And so you can see um, um, over here on the table on the left, manure rates uh, are given, the ones I described before. And if it says times two, that means we've applied that rate twice. So how much we actually added is that value, 17 times two and so on. Um, and so that's the biennial treatment, meaning it put, got manure 2012, took a year off, 
put manure on again in 2014. Uh, for the annual, it received, has received manure every year. And so uh, as expected, that's about twice as many nutrients for the annual treatment as we've seen for the biannual treatment. And hopefully that'll help you understand some of the um, responses that we saw in the study. And so um, you can see that this translates to a lot of material, a lot of organic carbon. We don't talk about the carbon as much. We talk about nitrogen and phosphorus, but we are adding a tremendous amount of organic carbon, organic matter to these systems. And I think that's part of the, the real difference that manure has compared to fertilizers um, in terms of how the crops and how the soils respond. And um, total nitrogen, we added almost 4,000 um, kilograms of nitrogen per hectare over a four year period. It's quite a bit on this highest rate. And again, that's not unusual for what you'd see next to a, a dairy. Um, and then phosphorus up to 3,000 pounds of P2O5, I'm sorry, kilograms. And uh, potassium was up to 9,000. And potassium doesn't get talked about as much when it comes to manure management because it's not, um, regulated environmentally, but uh, it does have a, it can have a big impact on, on crops and how they respond. So we'll first start off talking about the soils. And this is a photo of, um, of the site itself taken during one of our many pre-plant soil sampling events. This is Miles and Simon, and they're part of uh, April's team at ARS, and they've been a huge help to um, our success in this, in this study. So we really appreciate their help. So this is, um, we have a, a tremendous amount of soil data that we've collected over the years from the study. So I'm showing you kind of a snapshot of what that looks like at, half, at this halfway point in 2016. And so um, in this table, this is the pre-plant soil nutrient uh, values um, in responding to these repeated dairy manure applications that I've described. And this was taken to a one foot or 30 centimeter depth. And a few things to note here. Um, one of the things I feel like kind of helps this study sort of stand apart from other studies is the accumulation of the total nitrogen. Um, I made the decision not to show nitrate in this graph because it does change a lot over year after year. Um, it leaches out and that's something that April's going to talk about a little bit more in her slide. But I wanted to show you how the total nitrogen had, um, had actually doubled from the control um, control and fertilizer treatments up to the heaviest annual treatment. And what that is saying is that um, the majority of that total nitrogen is actually organic nitrogen compounds. And that is one of the trickier parts of the manure system is this accumulation of these organic nitrogen compounds and their sometimes unexpected release due to temperature and changes in the field environment over the summer. And so that's one of the kind of more interesting things I think about this system. I also feel like it's somewhat specific to the region. The fact that it's a cooler region, that they have um, semi-arid winters. They don't get a lot of precipitation or rain over the winter. And because of the components of the dairy manure, they don't break down as rapidly as like a hog manure or poultry litter. And all these different things combined, I think allow for that nitrogen to really accumulate um, in this specific uh, environment. You also see Olson phosphorus, um, increases uh, linearly with more manure and that's not that surprising but I think it's good for us to see and it's good for us to see that it only took uh, four years to get up to that 168 part per million Olson P which is very high. Um, in Idaho in the past they've started regulating um, how much manure you can apply after only 40 part per million and so we're definitely getting way above that value. Uh, Olson potassium is getting really high. Um, it's okay with these lower rates, um, but as you start to get putting on this manure year after year and not taking much break, it's getting really high. And why that matters is because if any of this food is being, um, any of the crops are being used for uh, feed, they're really high in potassium and cause milk fever and other issues um, in the cattle. And so that's something that the dairymen and the growers have to be aware of. Finally, you'll see that the soil EC, which stands for electrical conductivity, and it is a uh, indirect indication of soil salinity, um, it, it actually didn't get too high when we did our biennial applications. And I felt like that was because you put on manure and you take a year off and you have a crop like potato or sugar beets that get a lot of water. A lot of those salts seem to leach out. 
Um, but when you're putting it on every year, uh, you may not get as much time for that salts to move in the system and we seem to see higher salts. And a way you can compare the annual to the biannual is you compare this uh, 34 by two, this one, uh, treatment to the 17 by four. Those are relatively similar amounts of manure cumulatively over the four year period. And that can kind of give you a feel as to how those are comparing. In terms of organic matter, we have also seen organic matter increase uh, dramatically with more manure. And um, I think this is something that's sort of one of the unsung heroes in the soil health march that we're all on now, that uh, we talk a lot about cover crops and other things and their ability to increase soil organic matter, but um, manure doesn't get talked about as much. And I think that's because of the environmental issues that can be associated with it. But I think it's still something we need to consider that even at these relatively low manure rates, we were able to um, significantly increase that uh, organic matter content. And something I should have mentioned earlier, but if the letters, the little alphabet letters are different, that means that there's a significant difference between those two values. Um, in addition to the organic matter, we feel like it's probably contributing to a difference in our soil structure as well. And so in 2016, we came into the Northfield and actually um, my former postdoc, Morganco Day, looked at bulk density, porosity, and gravimetric moisture content uh, in the middle of the season. And he actually found that the soil was significantly lighter as manure history increased, uh, had more porosity, and um, what was at that one snapshot time and um, period of time had a higher uh, moisture content despite getting the exact amount of water, same amount of water as all the plots had received. And so I think these are important things to note that there are some positive things going on here. Um, so in that manure applications can have some of these improvements to um, what people are calling soil health these days, um, but you do have to still be cognizant of the high salinity, high potassium, high phosphorus, um, and other things that are happening uh, at the same time. And now I wanted to show this one other graph. This will be our only pest uh, pest graph today because we honestly have had troubles getting really strong significant uh, results in terms of um, uh, pest response and we've been working with we looking at weed pressure and disease pressure but we did finally in 2016 for the first time actually we spotted a decrease in spiral nematode in one of the two fields with increasing manure rate and um, I talked to Sada Fez about it and he said that this is something that they do see sometimes with more organic matter and that there um, will sometimes see this kind of suppression of certain kinds of nematodes. Um, I don't believe that spiral nematodes are a big issue in, uh, in Idaho or other regions, but I still think it's something worth noting, and we're gonna continue to watch this trend over the years. Um, in terms of nutrient uptake, I, love, I like this picture a lot because this is um, Miles standing in the field and he's actually standing in our control plot for the potatoes. And so you can see that we didn't get quite as much nutrient uptake uh, in those plots. We're getting a lot of senescence there. So this bar graph um, was a, is a cumulative bar graph put together from the first four years of data. And the height of each one of these bars represents how much manure and fertilizer nitrogen um, have been applied over the four year period. And so you can see with our heaviest rate, we've applied over 4,000 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare. Um, while you get down to your lower manure rates and you've only added about 1,000. Anyway, so each one of these different colored bars represents a different crop and how much um, nitrogen that they were able to remove from the field and um, over this four year period. And so you can see that um, you know, the sugar beet roots, uh, sugar beet roots and barley both increased how much nitrogen they took with more manure, which was kind of an interesting thing to see and to note. While potato tubers and wheat um, did not, they seemed to stay pretty steady as to how much nitrogen was removed. So the reason why I only show potato tubers and sugar beet roots is because the residues from these crops actually stay in the field. They are not removed. But I still wanted to show you what, the, what that nitrogen uptake looked like. And so these darker green sections um, are the sugar beet residues, and these lighter green sections are the, 
are the potato residues. And there's actually a substantial amount of nitrogen that is like that goes from the manure, that goes from the soil and goes into these parts of the plants, um, and then it's returned back to the soil. And so because we're not able to remove the, that piece, those crops, the root crops are not as efficient in taking that nitrogen off the field as something like a small grain, um, alfalfa or other types of um, crops where the entire crop is removed. 